Hi, and welcome to the Auditorium Theater. I'm Rich Regan, the theater's chief executive officer. Thank you for joining us for a virtual tour of our National Historic Landmark. You're about to see one of the most important buildings in Chicago. This building proved that Chicago could compete alongside New York, London, Paris, and other major cities. It helped Chicago secure the legendary 1893 World's Fair and shaped Chicago into the major metropolitan area that it is today. Let's get a closer look. The Auditorium Theater opened on December 9, 1889. The Auditorium Building, which the theater is a part of, was the brainchild of a real estate tycoon named Ferdinand Peck. He hired the architecture firm of Dankmar Adler and Louis Sullivan to help him bring his vision to life. The founders wanted to create a multi-use building with a hotel, office spaces, and of course our glorious theater. This was one of the first multi-use buildings in the entire world. The idea was that even if the theater couldn't bring in enough money with the performing arts, the revenue generated by the hotel and office spaces would be enough to cover expenses. A common model for real estate today, but a very new concept in 1889. At the time the Auditorium Theater was built, Chicago didn't have the greatest reputation. We were known as the city that burned because of the Great Chicago Fire of 1871 and the Slaughterhouse City because of the major meatpacking district. Not exactly what you want to be internationally renowned for. Around the same time that the auditorium opened, city leaders desperately wanted to secure the 1893 World's Fair to help bring some good publicity to the city. For obvious reasons, we needed it. Many people weren't sure that Chicago was up to the task of hosting such a major event. The auditorium opened just a few months prior to the United States Congress final vote on where to hold the World's Fair, and the buzz generated by the glorious theater's opening, attended by many from Washington, including President Benjamin Harrison, helped prove that Chicago was more than capable of hosting a successful World's Fair. Congress voted to hold the event here. Now I'd like to give you an overview of some of the characters I'll be mentioning throughout the tour. The man who had the whole vision for the theater, Ferdinand Peck, was a wealthy real estate tycoon, but he had democratic ideals. He loved opera, and he really wanted Chicago to have a grand opera house that was open to all the people of Chicago. That was a departure from the norm at the time when theaters were mostly open to the elite and the wealthy. Then we have Dankmar Adler, who is the theater's main engineer, planning the acoustical design of the building and making sure that the auditorium building, which encapsulates the theater, had a strong foundation. His partner, Louis Sullivan, was the man behind all of the incredible design work that you'll see around the theater. The gold stencils, the mosaics, the ornamentation. He's known for his signature phrase, form ever follows function. Adler and Sullivan also happened to employ a draftsman, a young man by the name of Frank Lloyd Wright, who was there as the auditorium was being designed and built. Wright considered Louis Sullivan his mentor, and many architectural elements that Wright is known for were inspired by his work with Sullivan. As I take you around on this tour today, you might notice that the floor is a bit uneven. Our floors are so uneven because we're basically built on top of what used to be Lake Michigan. Our foundation floats. Dankmar Adler, the great engineer, knew that the building would settle when he was making his plans for the auditorium. But he was anticipating six inches of settlement. The building has settled as much as 29 inches in some places. So was this great engineer just totally off in his calculations? The answer is no. He designed this ingenious foundation to build what was the heaviest modern building in the world on the marshland along a lake. So they laid the foundations for the building according to that plan. After they got to the first floor level, Adler went off to Europe to look at stage mechanics to determine what he wanted for the theater. When he left, Peck approached Sullivan and said, we've got this great idea. 
We want the auditorium to be the tallest building in Chicago. So we need an extra story on the main block and an extra story on the tower. And Sullivan agreed. So Adler came home and he found an extra 1,200 tons of weight added onto his foundations. And this is the result. Today you walk down three steps to get into the theater, but you used to walk up two steps to get into the building. Thankfully, the building stopped settling many, many years ago, and our foundation is sound. When you first enter the theater's lobby, you'll notice six beautiful stained glass windows above the main entrance. These are original. They were taken out in the 1930s and lost to time, or so we thought. We found them 30 years later under a pile of debris during the major renovation that took place here in the 1960s. The figures in these windows represent the different art forms that Peck, Sullivan, and Adler planned to present at the theater. They are wisdom, oratory, drama, music, poetry, and dance. And we still present all of these art forms today. But our founders might not have been thinking of Grateful Dead or Black Sabbath concerts when they were thinking about music 130 years ago. When Black Sabbath played the theater in 1971, we had just installed a very new, very expensive dance floor on the stage. The band completely destroyed it, but they were very nice about paying for a new one. We even received a letter from Black Sabbath guitarist Tony Iommi in 2014 when we celebrated our 125th anniversary, noting that the auditorium was already 82 years old when the band first played there in 1971, and it still survived our visits. The builders did a great job. So maybe the founders would have warmed up to concerts eventually, if they got compliments like that. Just before you walk into the house, you walk through this cramped low entryway. This is by design. It's an architectural technique called compression and release, where you walk through this entryway and you feel sort of claustrophobic and cramped just before you walk into the breathtaking, open, high ceiling theater. Let's take a look. This is one of the most breathtaking views of the auditorium and few get to experience it. Imagine being here on opening night in 1889, along with President Benjamin Harrison, Vice President Levi Morton, and countless other prominent political and social figures. Opera singer Adelina Patti took to the stage that night, and most people in the audience were even more excited to hear her sing than they were to listen to the President of the United States. We had 4,200 seats at the opening in 1889. We were the biggest performing arts venue in the country, beating the Metropolitan Opera House in New York City by 1,200 seats. Today, we have 3,900 seats. We lost a few hundred when we replaced the original 1889 seating in the 1960s with these cushioned seats you see on the orchestra and lower balcony levels. We still have our original seats up in the top balconies, in its early years, the theater was the home of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra and the Chicago Grand Opera, the predecessor to today's Lyric Opera. We also presented some of the best performing arts companies and artists from around the world, from the Metropolitan Opera Company to Sergei Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. Adler and Sullivan built in many elements that make the theater really flexible. You could widen the stage by raising up the reducing curtain or make the stage bigger by raising up the orchestra pit. There was even a way to turn the orchestra level of the theater into a ballroom or a banquet hall. We once hosted 1,200 people here for a formal dinner with Teddy Roosevelt. The space has also been used for circuses or baseball games. The auditorium theater has seen it all. 
Everything is movable. The theater can be anything we want it to be. This is our dress circle. In its original state, there was even more detail on every surface of the theater, and you can get a taste of what it would have looked like in these angle nooks. Every flat surface was covered with ornament. The ceilings, the columns, and the arches, all stenciled with gold leaf paint. These stencils were mostly covered up by 1900, but we are slowly restoring the theater to its original glory. Just last year, we redid these stencils on the arches, on the ceiling, and on the walls of these ingle nooks. We're now on our first balcony. We're famous for our golden glow, which you can really experience in all of its glory at this level. Electricity was relatively new when the theater was built. Most people didn't even have electricity in their homes when the theater first opened, and no one had ever used it like this before. You might be wondering how we change the carbon filament light bulbs when they burn out, and Adler and Sullivan thought about that too. There are actually catwalks above the arches, and when a bulb burns out, an electrician walks above the arches, reaches down, and pulls out the old bulb and replaces it with the new one. Much easier than building scaffolding each time you need to change a bulb. Most people also did not have air conditioning in 1889. Imagine 4,000 people squeezed in here on a hot day in August without air conditioning, dressed in Victorian clothes with heavy fabrics and long sleeves. There was no way we could use this theater in the summer. So Adler developed a form of air conditioning to make it possible to use the theater year round. Every day, we had 15 tons of ice delivered. That ice was then chopped up and delivered into our basement. The cool air from the ice was then blown up and out by a system of fans through the domes on the ceiling. So there was this big curtain of cool air that came down over the theater. And look at how beautiful those domes are going back to Sullivan's mantra of form follows function. Let's look at the murals for a moment. That side is spring, and this one is winter. They were both painted by the French-trained artist Albert Francis Fleury. And the one over the proscenium, painted by Charles Holloway. It connects the two. When the theater was first opened, people were scandalized by the nude figures in this mural and demanded that clothes be painted on the figures. But Sullivan and Holloway refused. A few decades after the theater opened, it fell on hard times. People weren't very interested in the auditorium hotel or the office spaces in the building because of the hotel's outdated bathrooms and the office location next to the noisy L tracks. The theater remained open throughout the Great Depression, but went bankrupt in 1940 and was taken over by the city. It was then converted into a serviceman center for the World War II soldiers from 1941 to 1945. And we even had a bowling alley in here. Today, this theater is only here by default. Roosevelt University swooped in and bought the building in 1947 for $1, but they kept the theater totally vacant. There were more college students than ever before, thanks to the GI Bill. And all of those college students needed a place to park their cars. So the kids wrote to the school newspaper and asked to turn the rundown theater into a much needed parking garage. Fortunately, the first president of Roosevelt University said no way. He didn't have the money to restore the theater, but he refused to have it destroyed. He preserved it long enough for a woman named Beatrice Spatchner and her friends to go out and raise money to restore and reopen the theater in the 60s. Spatchner raised over $3 million and employed a team to help revitalize the theater. The Auditorium Theater officially reopened on October 31st, 1967 with a performance by New York City Ballet. And this era is where it really gets good for fans of rock and roll. Whereas before the theater's closure, we had been the home to the symphony and the opera, the 1960s and 70s really looked a little different for us. We still presented major dance companies, but we also became one of Chicago's premier rock venues. Hundreds of famous musicians performed on this very stage. 
Jimi Hendrix was here in 1968 with a set that included hits like Foxy Lady and Purple Haze. Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young performed their first ever concert here in 1969 and the next day they took off for a little music festival called Woodstock. The Who, David Bowie, Prince, Aretha Franklin, Fleetwood Mac, Miles Davis, Queen, Nina Simone, Pink Floyd, they all played the auditorium. We still host many rock acts today, most recently David Byrne, Jack White, David Gilmore, and Mavis Staples, just to name a few. Here we are in the top gallery of the theater. I hope you're not afraid of heights. Up here you can see the original seats that were used in the theater in 1889. We still seat people up in these top balconies when we have sold out shows. Even if you're sitting all the way up here in our top gallery, you're able to hear a performer from our stage. There's a reason Frank Lloyd Wright called the auditorium the greatest room for music and opera in the world, bar none. We're renowned for our perfect acoustics, thanks to Dankmar Adler. Today, the Auditorium Theater is the proud Chicago home of the greatest performing arts companies in the world, including American Ballet Theater and Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater. In recent years, along with the rock concerts I mentioned earlier, we've hosted speakers like Ken Burns, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Hillary Clinton. In 2015 and 2016, the NFL Draft took place right here. And on December 9th, 2019, we celebrated our 130th anniversary with a free open house. Millions of people have been through our doors and made memories here at the auditorium. And we hope that you have the chance to make memories here too. Thank you for joining me. We look forward to when we can reopen our doors and welcome you back.